Amen. The title of my message this morning is Speak Grace, Grace to It. Speak Grace, Grace to It. Um, some of you know I love to watch messages and watch preachers. I love it. I learn a lot from them. And I have a few favorite special, special preachers that I like to listen to them on on daily basis and just open my heart to, to be ministered. I'm constantly with something in my hands, writing it down, everything that they say, because they just give sometimes so supernatural revelation, some some great things that it's, it's just life changing. And this week I was watching uh, Kenneth Hagan. Kenneth Hagan, I was watching some things that he was saying. And he said this that was so powerful, and I wrote it down. I want to share with you today. He said this. Some preacher asked, asked me one day, why you preach so much faith? You can't preach anything else. You don't know anything else. Why you preach faith all the time? And he said, obviously, this guy never really heard me or listened to me because I do preach on other things. But there is a reason why I preach faith so much. And this is why he said, this is what he said. And I want you to pay very close attention to this. This is what he said about faith. This is what he said. This is the reason why I preach faith so much, according to your statement. Number one, because you can't be saved without faith. <laughs> right? That's, that's just, just that alone, just that alone, it's enough for us to know that we need faith in our lives every day, in our pulpits, if we are preaching to get people saved. Preach faith, because without faith, nobody can be saved. The Bible says that you were saved by grace through faith. Number one, because you can't be saved without faith. You are saved by grace through faith. You can't walk the Christian walk without faith, he said. Number two, you can't walk the Christian walk without faith because the Bible says that we walk by faith. Number three, you can't live for God without faith because the Bible says we live by faith. You see? Number four, he said, you can't have your prayers answered without faith. Because Jesus said, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe that you have received and you will have it. So you can't pray without faith. Number five, you can't please God without faith. Because the Bible says that it is, it is impossible to please God without faith. So that's why we preach faith so much. That's why we live faith so much. That's why we declare faith so much. Because you can't walk without faith. Because we walk by faith. You can be saved without faith because we are saved through faith. You can please God without faith because the Bible says that it is impossible to please God without faith. So if you want to live a life where you please God, when you live in victory or you walk by faith, when you pray by faith and you receive your prayers, the answer of your prayers, you have to be based on the word of God and you have to be full of faith. If you're with me, say amen. And let me tell you a little more. Your faith is expressed by the words you speak. So you cannot just believe, you have to talk about it. Your faith is expressed by the words you speak. You want to know so much, how much faith so and so has? Just listen to the words that comes out of their mouth. How much, how, how full of the word they are, just listen to the word that comes out of their mouth. Because you can't help, you, your faith will be expressed through the words you speak. Period. Are you with me? Look what Paul said, quoting David in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 13 from the Passion Translation, he said, we have the same spirit of faith. Say this with me, spirit of faith. Spirit of faith. 
spirit of faith, not spirit of fear, not spirit of doubt, not spirit of negativity. We have the same spirit of faith. That is described in the scriptures when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. I believe and then I spoke in faith. Notice that he's not saying, I believe and I spoke. He said, when I spoke, I spoke out of my belief in faith. First, I believed and I spoke in faith. So we also first believe, then we speak in faith. Your words will express what's in your heart. Your words will express in what you believe and how you believe. Your words. Get this. Faith and power, faith and power, or faith and the power of God. Our voice activated. Faith and the power of God is voice activated. God was always way ahead of Steve Jobs. When people started with, hey, Siri, God already started, hey, spirit. I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. Because the Bible says that nothing happened. The Spirit of God in Genesis 1 was hovering over the face of the water. Nothing happened until God said something. Hey, Spirit. And until God said something, let it be light. And then the Holy Spirit brought the manifestation of what God said. Hey, Spirit. Are you with me? So faith and the power of God are voice activated. That's why we have to be constantly reminded about living by faith and the words we speak. Faith and the power of God are voice activated. That's why we have to be constantly reminded of our faith, of living by faith and the words we speak. That's why we need to get more messages on faith. That's why we need more messages about the words we speak. Some people may not like faith and confession. Some people may not like when you tell them, be careful what you say because you're building or destroying your life or your future. Some people don't really believe that. Oh, you should pay attention because it's literally happening. Just because some people get annoyed or they, they may say, oh, I don't really believe. That doesn't mean it's not working in your life. It doesn't mean it's not happening in your life. Like it or not, you will always have what you say. That's the Bible. You will always have what you say. Jesus said that, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. You will always have what you say. That's why we need to be constantly reminded about living by faith. Living by faith. And the words we speak. Expressing our faith through our words. Let me tell you something. How many news channels we have out there? How many in the same channel we have New shows throughout the day. We have one in the morning, then one mid-morning, and then one early afternoon, and then one in the late afternoon, and then another one evening, and then another one at 11 o'clock. How many, how many news just talking about negativity and fear, what's going on? You see, we are constantly reminded of everything ugly that is happening in the world. When are we going to start reminding ourselves of all the good things that God has done in our life and he's about to do in our lives? And that's why we need to believe, we need to declare, and we need to stand in faith and say, it's mine. Yeah, yeah. I believe, I receive, I declare, and I will see in Jesus' name. We need to be constantly reminded. When we tell people, watch the message, it's not because I want you to see my face and take me home with you. I'm okay where I live. I'm okay with the family I have. It's for your own benefit. We don't make any money out of this. This is to preach the gospel to empower you so you don't give the devil any room for negativity. 
to tell you it's not going to happen, to tell you you're not going to be healed, to tell you you're going to die early, to tell you you're, you're going to lose your job and you're not going to recover from this ugly season. You know, we don't want you to be, to, be, to be infected by this kind of virus and disease because this one can kill you faster than anything else. We want to empower you. We want to encourage you. We want to lift you up. We want to see you winning because that's the will of God for your life. We don't want to see you in depression. We don't want to see you living a melancholy life. We don't want to see you living an emotional life. One day you're happy, another day you're sad and broken and, and, and disgusted. We want to see you winning all the time. It doesn't mean you're not going to have battles. It doesn't mean you're not going to have difficulties. It means that you're not going to give in to the situation. You're not going to give in to the circumstances because you were not made to just get by. You were made to have a victorious life in Jesus Christ and through his word. And that's why we need to keep on preaching. Are you with me? Solomon said this to us in Proverbs 18, verse 20 and 21. Listen to this. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. In other words, you eat from your own words. You will be satisfied. In other words, stop thinking about food because this is not about food. It's just an analogy. You're going to be satisfied, happy, rejoiceful. In victory by the words you speak. Amen. Let me prove it to you. Let me read it again. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the words of his mouth, from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Verse 21. This one everybody knows. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You see how it's not talking about food. It's using this as an analogy to tell you, you're going to have a satisfied life. You're going to have a victorious life based on the words you speak. Amen. Based on the words we speak. And if, if this was the, the second wisest man that ever walked this earth, we should be stopped. We should stop and pay attention. If somebody that is, the person that is telling us is the second wisest man that ever walked on this earth, that means we need to listen to what he's saying. He probably knows what he's talking about. That was the second. What about the first? Because Jesus said the same thing. In different ways, but he meant the same thing. Watch in Matthew 12, 33. And 34, from the New Living Translation, Jesus said this. A tree is identified by its fruit. You see, both are talking about fruit and using this analogy to talk about words. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, in other words, if the words are good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brought of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Out of the abundance of the heart? Out of the abundance of the heart? Verse 37. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. The words. Now, watch, this is, this is, this is powerful. He's not saying your behavior. Your words. And that's why also the Bible says, Paul said in Romans 10, 9, that you are saved by believing and speaking. If you don't speak, you're in trouble. Or if you don't speak the right thing and speak the wrong thing, you're in trouble. By your words, you will be saved or you will be condemned. By your words, you have victory or you have failure. By your words, you're sick or you're healed. Amen. By your words, you're broke or you're prosper. Amen. Come on, somebody. Talk to me. 
So we see Jesus and Solomon tell us the same exact thing. A tree is identified by its fruit. In other words, a person, you and I, are identified by the words we speak. That's why I said in the beginning, you want to know somebody's faith? You want to identify in what they believe or not? Listen to what they are saying. Come on, somebody. This is a good message. This is a good message. I'm enjoying this myself. Because, like I said, this is a reminder. We need to be constantly hearing this. We need to. We need to. So, I showed you this so you can see that we cannot live the Christian life without faith and the power of our words if we expect victory. Amen? We cannot live the Christian life without faith and ignoring the power of our words if we expect victory. Listen to me. I have learned something. I have learned something throughout my life, especially with my, in my Christian life, my walk with Christ. I have learned something that we are all subject to troubles and suffering. That doesn't mean, I said this in the beginning, that when you're full of faith and you're full of the word, that you're not going to face troubles. The only difference, it's not gonna, you're not going to be sucked in. Sucked in by troubles and, di- and situations and, and difficulties. You're not going to give up. You're not going to quit. Because you know you win. Because you know you have the right to win. You have promises that tell you that if you live by faith and if you live by the promises of God in this word, you will have victory. So if we're not winning, it's not God's fault. Come on, talk to me a little bit. If we're not winning, it's not God's fault. So I have, uh, I have learned that in our lives, we are all subject to troubles and suffering. Especially, let me tell you this. The more you're, you know what you're doing, the more the devil will try to attack you. But the more he tries to attack you, the more he will lose in your life. Amen. I'm going to be very honest with you. Some people say, well, I don't understand. I know before when I was in the world, I didn't have much trouble because you were in, you were in any trouble to the, to the devil. He was happy with you there. Now that you're full of the word, now you are a threat to the devil. Amen. That's why he's trying to discourage you. But you have to understand now who you are and what you have so you can put him back in his place. Amen. Who told you that you're going to get saved and live a, you know, a peaceful life? You want to live a peaceful life? Die. Now talk to me a little bit. Somebody one day asked a pastor friend of mine, said, a oh, pastor, you know, just pray for me that I don't have any more troubles. He said, no problem. He said, Father, in Jesus' name, take him tonight. Let him die tonight. When he leaves this place, I go, no, pastor, don't pray like that. I said, my friend, you said you don't want, you don't want, you, you want peace. You don't want more trouble. You don't want trouble? Go to heaven. There we can guarantee that you don't have any trouble. There's no devil. There's no fear. It's unconditional love. By everybody, you're, you're going to be happy. You're gonna, you want to live in peace? Then die. But if you want to live in victory, let's get you some weapons. Amen. Come on, somebody. Talk to me a little bit. Let's get you some weapons. Let's get you the word. Let's get you rooted in faith. Let you, let's make you understand who you are. Let's stop with this thing, this identity crisis. That one day you think of something. The next day you think of something else. You want to be something. The other day you want to be something else. Understand and remember who you are. And get yourself loaded with the word. And put the devil back in his place. You may not have peace. But let me tell you, you're going to win. And let me tell you, win is, winning feels good. Feels good. We're all subjected to trouble. We're all subjected to suffering. In Matthew chapter 5, 45 from the NIV version says this. God causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So if you live in this world. You're subjected to problems. You're subjected to suffering. Just like everybody is subjected to sun and rain. 
God is just. It's not about believers and unbelievers. You see, let's talk about what's going on right now. This coronavirus, it didn't knock on the doors that were unbelievers. It knocked on everybody's door. It wasn't for everybody. This, this, this virus didn't ask, are you a Christian? Are you a Catholic? Are you an atheist? It, it came for, to everybody. We know who's behind this whole thing. It's the devil. But everybody that lives in, on this earth was subject to it. Subject to it. And again, you have a choice after this. You have a choice. You either give in, live in fear, or you stand in your faith and his word, and you rebuke that devil. You rebuke this devil with this virus and not in my house. Everybody subject to suffering and troubles. But when, but when, and how you are going to respond and come out of the storm is up to you. I'm going to say that one more time. Everybody subjected to suffering. Everybody subjected to troubles. But when and how you're going to come out of this? And when and how you're going to come out of the storm and the trouble and the situation and the ugly season? It's up to you. Your words in the midst of the storm will determine your outcome. Say this with me. My victory is my decision. Think about that. The Selah moment right now. My victory is my decision. How I'm going to come out of this is up to me. I have learned that ugly seasons, Kevin, can break you or make you. I have seen people in difficult times rise higher. I also have seen people in difficult times. That's right. That's right. It's your decision because the sun and rain comes to everybody. Everybody. Winners are not the ones that are special. Winners are the ones that don't give up. Don't quit. Winners are not super special people. Winners are just not quitters. Look at what Paul said. This is powerful. I want you to see this. Look what the Apostle Paul says. In Romans chapter 8, let me give you a little bit of context, and then we're going to read from verse 31. In Romans chapter 8, from the New King James Version, you see Paul talking about the present, the present sufferings of the believer and the future glory. How many of you remember that? He's talking about the present suffering, what you're going through right now, and the future glory. In verse 19, he says, for the creation was subject to frustration. For the creation, in other words, that the sons and daughters of God were subjected to frustration, disappointment, hurting, pain. Are you with me? The creation of God, the sons and daughters of God were subjected to frustration. But then he says in verse 31, this is what I like. Pay very close attention to this. He says this. What then we shall say to these things? Haha. <laughs> you see? He's saying everybody subjected to suffering. Everybody subjected to problems, frustration. But what are you going to say to those things? What then? What then? That's what he's saying. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's what he said. He asked the question and he gives the answer. So what are you going to say to the trouble and the frustration? This is what you should say. If my God is for me, if God is for us, who can successfully be against us? They can be against us, but they're not going to be successful. They can form the weapon but the weapon will not prosper. Come on, somebody. What shall we say to these things? What shall we say to? What shall we say to? What shall we say to? Say to. Say to. Some translation says, what are you going to say about these things? And I have learned 
that there are a lot of people that they talk about instead of talking to. Paul didn't say, what are you going to talk about? He said, what are you going to talk to? How are you going to talk to? It's not talking about the problem. It's talking to the problem. It's not talking about the mountain. It's talking to the mountain. It's not talking about the sickness. It's talking to the sickness. If they have name, oh, come on. This is maybe crazy for some people. If they have name, they got to, they, 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 they can't hear. You may not believe, but this is how I believe. They have a name, they can't hear because the Bible says that every name, every name, every name will bow down to the name of Jesus. If it's going to bow down to the name of Jesus, that means they're going to hear a, a, wor- a, a word of command. Bow down to the name of Jesus. So they, they hear, somehow they hear. They have ears. So if they have name, talk to it. Is it cancer? Talk to the cancer. Is, the, is it corona? Talk to corona. They put name on everything. They put name on storms. They put names on hurricanes. So talk to them. Because they have name, they got to be listening. Amen. They got to be listening. We talk to our cars. We talk to the microwave. We talk to the refrigerator. We talk to the TV. Come on, somebody. We talk to everything. So talk to the problem instead of talking about the problem. Instead of talking about the problem. Then what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? My God, I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing in this room. I feel the anointing in this room. If you feel the presence of God, the anointing in this room, if you get in this word, give God a big shout of praise in Jesus' name. Now, I said a big shout of praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My God. They talk about their sufferings. They talk about the problems. They talk about their frustrations instead of talking to them. Don't talk about it. Talk to it. Don't talk about it. Talk to it. Watch what I'm going to tell you now. The words that come out of your mouth are not only building or destroying your future, but are expressing your faith in what you believe. I told you a little bit about that in the beginning. The words... That comes out of your mouth are not only building or destroying your future, but are expressing your faith or in what you believe. Your mouth can give you away. Come on. I say this to people. You want to know how your life will be in five years from now? Listen to the words you're speaking right now. You want to know how your future is going to be like? Listen to the words that's coming out of your mouth now. Your words, pay very close attention to this. Your words are the platforms you're going to step on it tomorrow. Your words are the platforms you're going to step on it tomorrow. Just like God created this whole world by his own words, you can create and establish your world by your words. You can build it. You can destroy it. You choose. It's your choice. Are you with me? Now get this. You may not believe God's word. You may have a hard time believing in everything that God says. You shouldn't, but you may. You may have problems. You may not believe in God's word, but you better believe that the words you speak will come to pass. If you don't believe that everything God said about you will come to pass, I have news for you. You better believe in your own words because your words will come to pass. I say this to people. I was talking to my wife this week about this. And we both said the same thing. You better have a hard, you, you may have a hard time believing in God's word. But you better believe in your own words. You better believe in what you speak. Because if you also have a hard time believing in you, (laughs) because we 
I believe everybody in this room and everybody under the sound of my voice, we believe in what we say. Talk to me. We believe in what we say. Hmm. Get this. You can't live life not honoring not honoring your own words and then on Sunday switch to Mark 11, 23. I'm talking to you about your life now. You cannot live life not honoring your own words, the words you give to people. And then when it comes to Sunday, you want to switch to Mark 11, 23. And then expect to have godly results. Some people don't even follow what they say. But they want to believe And what they're saying about God's word, God's word once a week. They don't believe and they don't follow anything they say. But on Sunday, they want to speak to the mountain. You have to change. You have to change how you honor your own words first. Because again, it's a lot easier for you to believe in what you say. And make your heart believe in what you say than what somebody else is saying. Even God. It's a lot easier. Listen to this. You can't live life in a certain way. You can't live life in a certain way, and then when crisis come, you change your confession to start speaking faith. Has to be a lifestyle. Not just when things are bad. Not just when things are not going your way. Speak doubt, negativity. We don't honor the things we say to other people. But then when crisis come, we remember that pastor talked about Mark 11, 23. So I'm going to speak to the mountain. You're confusing your own heart because your heart don't believe you. Come on, somebody. Talk to me. Your heart don't believe you. You know why? Because you said many other things before and never followed through. How now your heart's going to believe you that what you're saying is going to happen? Come on, somebody. Talk to me a little bit. You're confusing your own heart. When you start honoring your own words, your heart is going to start believing in everything you say. Talking about your spirit. It's going to start honoring and believing everything you say because you are following your own words. You tell people you're going to be there at 8 o'clock, be there at 8 o'clock. You tell people you're going to be there at 12, be there at 12. You can, and you can go, give them a phone call. But do what you say. We live in a generation. We live in a generation, and you, I'm, I'm sure all of you can testify and agree with me on this, that we live in a generation that people's word doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. I see people sometimes that we meet in, in, in public places, and, they, and they're watching our messages. They're watching the services online, and they hug us, and oh, my God, it's so good, Pastor. Next Sunday, I'll be there. You never see them. Why are you telling people you're going to go there if you know in your heart you're never going to go? Come on, talk to me. Some people say, oh, I'm going to go. But they know they're never going to go. Why are you going to say, well, no, I'll be there at 7.30 if you know it's impossible for you to be there at 7.30 if you leave your job at 7.30? I'll be there at 7.30. Okay, but... You get off at 7.30. How are you going to be there at 7.30? Are you just going to show up over there like that by the spirit? The speed of light? Come on, somebody. You see? But people think that it's normal. People think that it's normal. They tell you, oh, no, I'll see you next Sunday. I'll see you next Thursday. I'll see you this. But they don't follow what they say. That's the reason why they don't believe in what God says about them. Why? Because they don't believe in the things they say. Their hearts are confused because they said, it's not going to happen. This guy never follows what he says. I know I'm talking the truth. If you're with me, say amen. James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 6 says this from the New Living Translation. But when you ask him, when you pray, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. Turn to your neighbor and say this, do not waver. Stay firm. Stay still. Stay standing. 
when you pray, you be sure that your faith is in God alone. And do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that it's blown and tossed by the wind. The Bible's talking about a double-minded person. Unsettled like the wave, unstable like the waves of the sea. It comes here, a few minutes later, it's over there. And then a few minutes later again, it's back in the front. I, you know, we say this, double-minded person, it's a person that have two opinions about the same subject. With your, one side of your mouth you believe and the other side of your mouth you don't believe. With the side of your mouth you get a letter in the mail and you say, oh my God, this bill is going to kill me. We're going we're to lose the house. We're going to lose the kids. We're going to lose the car. We're going to lose everything. And then you, you recover yourself and say, well, no, but I believe that God will provide. I believe that God will provide all my needs according to his. Wait, wait a second. Are you going to die or are you going to believe that God will provide? Which one are you? Which side of the fence you're standing? Oh, no, I feel every pain right now. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. No, no, but, but Pastor said that, you know, by the stripes of Jesus, we're here. Which side of you? On which side are you? Double-minded person. One day you believe, one day you don't believe. You, one day you want to serve, one day you don't want to serve. One day you want to love, the next day you want to hate. A double-minded person, unsettled unstable in all their ways. That's what the Bible says. Be sure that your faith is in God alone and don't waver. Do not waver. Verse 7. Watch this. Watch this verse 7. Look what James is saying. And you better believe James. James was Jesus' brother. (laughs) Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Talk to me a little bit. This kind of people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything they do. You know people that start things and never finish? You know, I do. You know people that start things and they never finish? Unstable in everything they do. You can't go to Mark eleven twenty three if you don't get fixed. What's going on in James? And what we just said in James chapter 1. Because it's not going to happen. You're believing. No, you're speaking, but you're not believing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not... It's not formula. It's not because I told you to do it that you, it's going to happen. First, you got to make sure your faith is in God alone. That's what the verse is saying. And do not waver. Do not waver. Look what Jesus said in Mark 11. You know this well. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For I, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt, and does not doubt, and does not doubt. You know what the word doubt means? Differ. Differ. You don't believe in what you're saying. You're saying something, but your heart, your heart believes something else. And when you're... When it's and the word in the dictionary different means to go against it. So, in other words, if you're speaking in faith, speaking in faith, but you're doubting in your heart, you're going against your own words. In other words, you're canceling its power. You are canceling its power. Be removed and cast into the sea, it does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Repeat with this, repeat this with me. Whatever he says. Say this, I will have whatever I say. 
Whatever means whatever. Good or bad. Now think about that. You will have whatever, he says. When we read this, most times we think about the great things we can have by doing what Jesus said. But remember that Jesus ends the chapter, ends the verse, I'm sorry, saying, you will have whatever you say. So it's not enough to speak in faith. You have to stop speaking fear. It's not enough to speak positive and speak life if you don't, if you speak it, if you speak negativity and doubt and fear all the time. You got to change what you're saying and correct what you're saying. Yes. Because you will have whatever you say. And whatever means whatever can be good or can be bad. Again, you can build your life or destroy your life based on the words you speak. You will know the fruit. We will know the tree by its fruit, by its words. If you're getting anything this morning, say amen. amen. So let me, let me start closing this now. This is what you need to say to your mountain. Remember that the title of this message is, what is it? How many of you remember? Speak grace, grace, to it. grace, grace to it. Zechariah chapter 4 from the Amplified Version, verse 7 says this. What are you, O great mountain of obstacles? I like how this starts. Who do you think you are, mountain? Who do you think you are, trouble? You see, Zechariah starts by speaking to it, not about it. He was talking to it, not talking about it. What are you, O great mountain of obstacles? Before Zerubbabel, who will rebuild the temple, you will become a plain, insignificant. And he will bring out the, the capstone of the new temple with loud shouts of grace, grace to it. Grace, grace to it, not nah, grace, grace about it. Who are you, great mountain? You're going to come down to dust with shout. With loud shouts of grace, grace to it. Speak grace, grace to it. You know what that means? To speak grace, grace to a situation? It means to change what you're saying to the situation. Because this is what grace, grace means. Graciousness, kindness, favor, beauty, grace. Gracious, pleasant, precious, well-favored. Well-favored. So what do you need to do? You need to, change the, you need to change the adjectives and the adverb. You need to change the active, the addict, addict, check the, ah, see. Okay, another time is going to be tongues. <laughs> and the adverb. You change what you're saying to the situation. Instead of saying, this is horrible, this is problem, this is ugly, this is disgusting. You change the adjective. You change that. You change and you change the adverb. Instead of describing the problem, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Instead of describing the trouble, describing the problem, create a solution with your words. Amen. That's what it means to speak, speak grace, grace to it. That's what it means. You change what you're saying. You change the words. And instead of describing the problem, you change and you create a solution for the problem with your words. With your words. You see, Paul, Jesus, and Solomon, and even God are saying to us, don't speak about your mountains, your frustration. Instead, you speak good things to it. You speak good things to it. You don't like what you see? Then change it. Because God gave us the power to do such a thing. Yep. You don't like what you see? You have the power to change it. Instead of speaking, instead of speaking frustration, you speak good things to it. Doesn't speak what you don't speak what you see, you speak what you want. 
Don't speak what you see, but speak what you want. Grace, grace to it. Graciousness, kindness, favor, well favored, precious. You see, you change what you're saying. Listen very close to this. And guard that in your heart. The reason why I'm saying to you so much today and always will in this church about your faith and your words. Because the devil, the devil is not afraid of the reading word. The devil is afraid of the spoken word. He doesn't care about this. He cares when this is in here. Oh. Jesus defeated the devil by saying, it's written. He didn't say, let me go home and get my Bible. And I'm going to rub it in your face. It's not about that. Yeah, I, I grew up with my grandmother having the Bible open in Psalm 91. To this day, if you ask her what's saying in Psalm 91, she doesn't know. Doesn't mean anything. What's the point? You think the devil is afraid of this? If you don't believe in this, if you don't believe in the power that it's in this, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the revelations of the heart of God in this word in your heart, this is just another book. Amen. I see people in these days that we see protests all around the world. And, and some people, they want to they wanna hate on Christians. So to do that, they open the Bible and start ripping the pages. Do you think you're doing it? That's just another book in your hand. But when it comes to the, 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 the hands of the right person, ha, 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 ha. It's fine. You can read the Bible all you want. Do you think God is going crazy? Oh, my God. I'm going to kill him right now because he'll rip. You think God cares? Shame on, shame on the person. Shame on you for doing such a thing. Some, some Christians got offended. Why are you getting offended? For those that don't understand the power of God, it's, this is craziness. And this is nothing. This, for them, this is just letters. But for us, is the power of God in action. Yeah. This is the living word of God. Amen. Because we believe. And the devil is not afraid of the reading word. He's afraid of the spoken word. Jesus defeated the devil by saying it's written. And Jesus defeated the devil as a man and not as a God. To show it to us, this is how you win. This is how you win. You want to put the devil back on his place? Speak the word. And when you speak the word out of revelation and out of truth and believe, that's when you're going to see godly results. Because the devil was also quoting the Bibles, but he didn't have revelation. He only has the letter. And the spirit of, 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 of lying. He was quoting the scripture, but not with the spirit of truth. Jesus was speaking the word with the spirit of truth. And when you do that, you see results. You see the word in action. You see the power of God in action. You see your faith in action. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 9. This is going to be quick now. My last verse. Chapter 9. Verse 18. We know the story so well. I just want to give you. Five, four reasons why this woman was healed. We're going to talk about the woman with the issue of blood. I want to give you four little things, four little points to prove to you, to show you why and how this woman was healed. Are you with me? Verse 18, while he was saying these things to them, a ruler a ruler, synagogue official, entered the house. I'm reading from the Amplified. And kneeled down and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just now died. But come, 
and lay your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and began to accompany the ruler with his disciples. Then a woman has suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and came up behind him and touched him and touched him the tassel fringe of his outer robe. For she had been saying to herself, for she had been saying to herself, if I only touch his outer robe, I will be healed. But Jesus turning and seeing her said, take courage, daughter. Your personal trust and confidence, your faith in me has made you well. And at once, the woman was completely healed. Another translation says, your faith has made you whole. There is a difference between being healed and being made whole. There is a difference about healing and wholeness. Watch this. Watch this. Like again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just want to give you these four points, and I want you to meditate on this this whole week. Why this woman was made whole. When you're made whole, listen to this. It's not just about your physical body. It's every area of your life. Amen. You know why? Even her finances, because the Bible says that she has spent all her finances with many physicians. And she grew worse. And she grew worse. But when Jesus said, your faith made you whole. Your faith made you whole. Jesus said, you're going to be restored of everything you have lost. Even the years of suffering. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. I heard this one day, and this blessed my heart. If somebody's healed, they can get sick again. But if you're made whole, mm, my God. If somebody's healed, they can get sick again. But if you're made whole, are you ready for these four little points? Yes. Number one, she was healed because she heard about Jesus. Faith comes by. The Bible says that when she heard about Jesus, when she heard that Jesus was in town, her faith. Increased. Grew in her. So she was healed, number one, because she heard. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. Number two, she was healed because she spoke herself into being healed. She spoke herself into being healed. This woman was alone. This woman was separated from society and family for 12 years. 12 years, living alone, but she heard. And when she heard, she started speaking to herself and speaking herself into being made whole. My God. Number three, she was healed not just because she spoke, but because she kept on saying to herself, she kept on speaking. This is, wasn't a one-time event. She kept on speaking, the Bible says. She kept on saying to herself, she has been saying. She had been saying. You see, it's not, you can't remember what I said to you. Remember what I said. My message, you really have to pay attention. Because I'm going to tie the knots when I'm getting to the end. Remember what I said to you. That you cannot... Live a lifestyle of speaking doubt, negativity, and fear. And then when you think it's time for service, you want to speak to the mountain in faith. No, she was saying the whole time. She had been saying she kept on talking to herself, speaking to herself that she was going to be healed. I don't need Jesus to lay hands on me. I don't need anybody to notice me. I need to touch him and I will be healed. She spoke herself into being healed. She believed. She didn't confess her healing once, but she did it repeatedly. And number four, she was healed because she put an action to her faith. She put feet to her faith. She acted on it. 
Because she could have stayed there speaking the whole time. I'm going to touch Jesus and never go. Your faith has to have action. Corresponding action. Let me read these four for you again because I want you to get this and meditate on this this whole week. That's your homework. She was healed because she heard about Jesus. She was healed because she spoke herself into being healed. She was healed because she kept saying to herself, she believed. She didn't say it once, but she kept on speaking to herself. And she was healed because she, she said it and she acted on it. She put feet to her faith. Remember what James said in James 2.20? From the Amplified Version. But are you willing to recognize that faith without good works, faith without action is dead or useless? She could speak all all, all she want. She could declare her whole life. But she never took the action to go. Nothing was going to happen. Have to have faith. You have to have action. Faith without corresponding action is dead. Faith is action. Faith is alive. Faith is not dead. Faith is. Faith wasn't. Faith wasn't going, it's not going to be. Faith is. You see, it's present, it's real, and it's alive. It requires action. You believe, you speak, and you follow what you say. You believe your words, and you believe God's word towards you. Did you get anything this morning? Stand with me in Jesus' name. Yeah.